Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Victory. Oh, my God. It's so good to be home. It's so good to see your wonderful places. Woo. So overwhelming to be here and to see all of your wonderful faces and just to be able to be in community with you once again. I, I can't even begin to express the love of God that's in my heart for you and the love that I feel that you give back to me. Thank you so very much. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I want to honor our apostles in their absence today. Thank God for them. Amen. Love them so very, very dearly. I thank God they have supported me. I mean, in every season of my life, even to the point of transitioning to Georgia and just, you know, allowing me to continue to be a part of the ministry and just to be here, it's such an honor and it's such a blessing. So thank you all so very, very much. Um, wow, I have so much that, um, that I want to say. I'm, I'm full. I was sharing with somebody. I said, it's been a minute since I've been you know, in a pulpit, so y'all bear, bear with me. Um, <laughs> I want to welcome those of you who are on, uh, online, the VFAM, welcome. Um, put something in the chat, let us know that you're here, you're with us. We trust that this word is going to be a word for you. Thank God, I, like the worship, I can't even begin to tell y'all, like I'm so full. I just, I, I imagined and dreamed, you know, of just being here and being able to worship with you all again. Um, I have been to a lot of churches and visited a lot of churches since I have been gone. And I just have to tell y'all, bar none, there is no place in the world like victory. There's no place, no place, I'm telling you, no place. No place like the word that you get, no place like the worship, no place for allowing the Holy Spirit to move and to have his way, no place to come to get healed, to get loved, to get fed, to prosper. I mean, there is no place like it. Amen. No place like it. There are so many places that's out there where the Word of God is there, but there's tradition and there's legalism and there's all of these things that keep you bound. And when you come here at Victory, there is such a level of freedom to be who you are. Dress up, dress down, do how you do, be yourself, and love God in the midst of it. Amen. I love it. I'm, I'm free. You're free. Amen. Today, we are free. No more chains holding us. We are free. So I thank God. Amen. Thank God for my bestie, the Bowie family, Georgia. Amen. Been around for a long time. Thank God for them, for my children, for my son. And also, I just want to say this. I shared it with Pastor Cynthia before. You know, when my son and my daughter in love comes to church, thank you all for loving on them. Thank you for always accepting them unconditionally, always. Nobody is perfect. Our lives are not perfect, but you do love unconditionally. And I'm so grateful and so thankful that they always find community when they come here. They always find love and acceptance when they come here. So God bless you and thank you. Amen. Y'all ready to get into the word this morning? All right. Praise God. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about God's financial plan. You can stay standing. I'm going to say a couple of things, and, and then we're going to pray. Amen. Y'all know y'all used to standing in this church. Come on, help me out. <laughs> Praise God. Um, I'll be talking about the God of ways and means this morning. Psalms 103 and 7 in the King Version says, He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. So I believe during this season, beloved, that it is God's financial plan. My prayer for us is that God will make known his ways to us. It's not just about material things. It's not just about houses and cars, but it's about knowing God. How do I relate to God when he blesses me and he causes me to prosper? How do I relate to others when I'm blessed and he causes me to prosper? 
prosper. And so like Moses, we want to sit and speak to God face to face. I want to have a deep longing on the inside of me to be able to relate to my God and to hear his voice and to be able to respond in the way that he would desire us to respond. This is really all about how God uh, plans to put his ways and his means in our life. He has methods and he is a way maker. The, it, the children of Israel sought God's hand, but I say to you today, will you seek his face? God rained down manna from heaven. God fed, fed them with quail that dropped from the sky. He gave them water for a rock, from a rock, and he did not fail them. He gave them just what they needed when they needed. Yet Moses was the one who sought after his presence. Amen. So today we want to look at the ways and means of God concerning prosperity. Amen. Praise God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you in the precious name of Jesus. God, I just thank you for the honor and the privilege to stand before your people, a great people, a hungry people, a mighty people, loving and kind, your people, your people who are redeemed, oh God. And I thank you that you would touch their hearts and their minds even right now today. Touch their ears that they may hear. Give them eyes that they may see and a heart to understand. Cause the word to multiply and to produce in their lives. Father, cause their families to be blessed above all families in the earth, causing them to leave a legacy and to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 You may have your seats. Amen. Praise God. So as I was, you know, just uh, seeking the Lord uh, concerning what to share with you today, again, my heart and the journey that I have been on over the last couple of years, probably four or five years really, has really been about learning God's ways and seeking his ways. And you know, something happened to many of us during the pandemic. For some, good things happened. For some, not so good things happened. But what I've recognized is that through the pandemic, the landscape of my heart was changed, changed towards people, changed towards God in a good way. I've experienced suffering at a level that I've never experienced it before, grief and heartache and pain and loss, losing so many family members. But you know what? I'm not bitter in my soul. I'm not bitter in my heart. Amen. I'm not afraid. I don't suffer from anxieties. I don't worry about things because my God is a God who will supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. Glory. Amen. And he will supply your needs too. It does not matter what it is. It's not always, yes, we need money. Yes, we need things to be able to live. But there is, a, there is something deeper that God is trying to get to us. And he wants us to know his ways. Why? Because knowing God's ways helps to protect us. That means that somebody can't come to me and sell me something you know what I'm saying? There, 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 there is scams that's out there galore. There's investment scams that's out there. But when I'm close to God and I can hear God and I can hear his voice, then I'm not easily swayed by the things that I see or hear. I'm not running behind get-rich-quick schemes to be able to get money real quickly. No, we're doing this thing the way that God would have us to do this thing. Amen? And when we do it God's way, God will always prosper us. So ways and means, what does all of this mean? So in my studies, I found out that there's this powerful committee that's in Congress called the Ways and Means Committee. And it is one of the oldest committees in Congress, and the people that sit on these committees are very influential and very powerful. So what do they do, Elder Ellis? They actually write tax laws that govern who pays taxes, when they pay taxes, how much they pay taxes, appropriations for the federal government to make sure it continues to run. So if a man can do that to see about a nation, how much more will your God, the God of ways and means, take care of you? He'll put methods and give you witty ideas and inventions that will cause money and things to come to you. God himself is a God of ways and means. Come on, tell your neighbor, say he's a way maker. 
God is a way maker. He has put a system in place. And I cannot leave today without telling the pork chop testimony. Can I do the pork chop testimony? Okay, I'm going to tell it. Everybody hadn't heard it, so I got to tell it. Okay, I got to tell it. So I'm young in the Lord, maybe about four or five years into the Lord and really learning about tithing and about giving. And my husband was active duty military. We PCS went to um, Hawaii and I was in the military, had gotten out, but I was working and have always worked. But when we got there, the Lord said to me, I don't want you to work. And so my husband, he was somewhat concerned because he's like, okay, we used to a, you know, two income household. So what we going to do here? And I said, well, the Lord told me not to work, baby. So we're going to have to figure this thing out and let God do what, he go, what he's going to do. So he worked out the budget and he said, you got $200 a month to buy groceries for four people. $200 a month, y'all, that's not a whole lot. I mean, most families spend $200 a week in groceries. And so I said, okay. I said, God, I know that you're working something out on the inside of me, and I'm going to let you work in me. So I would go to the grocery store, to the commissary. I would do coup- cut coupons, pray, speak in tongues, and I would always come out with seven, eight, nine, ten bags of groceries, and everything would last until the next time around. But one time I went, and I only had a few bags of groceries. And I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm just going to trust you. See, the God of ways and means is not concerned about resources because God has all the resources. The earth is the Lord. It belongs to him, everything. Everything belongs to God. So we need not ever have to worry about resources. And so we get down to the last week. And I opened up the last pack of pork chops. Okay, y'all, I don't eat pork chops no more, so (laughs) praise him. But anyway, last pack of pork chops, and I said, God, this is it. Last box of rice for dinner. This is it. A little bit of cornflakes and a little bit of milk for the kids. I'm going to need you to work this out for me. Show me how to do this, God. So really, in my mind, I'm thinking somebody's going to stop and give me something. Somebody's going to drop some food by. I'm going to get a box in the mail. You know how we do when we're trying to work out how God's going to bless us. We think it's coming in the mailbox. We think it's coming through the mail. We think somebody, you know, we're walking up to people just to see if they're the ones that's going to give us something. Y'all know how we do. Stop acting like you don't know. You know how we do. Because we have this expectation. We don't know how God's going to come, so I have this expectation. So I'm cooking. I have four pieces of pork chop, and as I put the pork chop in the frying pan, Jesus, I kept pulling the pork chops out, and after I pulled the fourth one out, I opened up the pan, and there was more pork chops in the pan right before my eyes. And I stepped back, and I said, oh, my God, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Is this really real? And so I'll take them pork chops out, and then there's some more pork chops left in the frying pan. And for a whole week until my husband got paid, we ate rice, we ate pork chops, and we had some salad. For a whole week, God sustained our family. What was God trying to show me? Not only was he a provider, but he cares about me. Not only was he saying, I'm your provider, but I need you to trust me because I know what I'm doing in your life. I know how to take care of you. I can take care of you better than any man. I can take care of you better than any sugar daddy. You don't need him. You got God. He's sweeter than any man will ever be to you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I'm telling you, God did it time and time and time again. That same year, we come around to Christmas, and my husband, he was so disappointed. He was like, oh, my God, I can't, you know, give to my family the way I want to give to my family. He was just heartbroken, and to truth be told, we had like hamburgers on the table to eat for Christmas dinner. And I said, you know, Lord, I know you're going to work it out. I don't know how you're going to do it. And then he gets a call from his unit, and they were like, Sergeant Ellis, we need you to come in. We need, um, I think they call them um, uh, SNCOs or something like that. They needed a staff duty NCO. And so he goes, and he's helping out and stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, it's our wedding anniversary, why why are they calling him? But God, you know, you work it out. And little did I know that God was working it out. So they had this big hoopla in his unit, they had food, they had toys, they had all kinds of stuff, but people didn't show up. 
So all the stuff that was left over that people didn't show up with, they packed it up in his car and he brought it home. I'm like, can God not supply your need? God is able. What was he trying to tell me? I am the God of ways and means. I have methods to get money and prosperity in your life that you don't know nothing about. I have things that's working behind the scene. You have no idea of what God will do for you and how he can do it for you. Amen. So this system that he puts in place, a method and a means of resources for achieving prosperity in your life. Go with me to Isaiah 55, 7 through 11. King James Version says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So the God of ways and means gives us an invitation, and that invitation is open to anyone. You can come at any time, ask God to forgive you. As a matter of fact, he's always knocking at the door of your heart, wanting you to return, wanting you. So you may say, God, I've made some terrible mistakes. I've made some financial mistakes. I've been disobedient. I've not always done the things that I should be doing. But God says, no, you come to me. He is a God of compassion. He is a God God of mercy and a God of love. And our biggest mistake sometimes as people is we compare God to people. So man lets us down, woman lets us down, children lets us down, and we somehow make a comparison that God is like man. He's like, oh no, I'm not like man. He says in verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So his words are not like some of our words. You know, sometimes we say things that we regret that we have said them and we want to take it back. We, don't, we, we, we may say things like, man, I, I, I can't seem to make ends meet. Or, or, or man, I'm, it's like as soon as I get some money, the money is gone. And God is not saying that about you. God is not saying that. God saying, I called you prosperous. I called you blessed. You are empowered to prosper. You are blessed. He called you blessed. He's not speaking those negative words over us. And then he says his word is not going to return unto him void. What does that mean? It's not going to return unto him empty. You can have what you say when you say what God says. If you say what God says, you can have what you say. You can have it. God shows that his plans, his ways, his means are higher than ours. His thoughts more elevated than ours. His counsels will always stand. So the rain descends on the earth and accomplishes his great plans. And so it is with his words, his promises will be fulfilled, his methods and resources to bring about prosperity and success in your life and mine will take effect. So I want you to be encouraged today to receive his grace and open your heart and your mind to be able to see and hear and believe the different ways that God will bless you. How will God bless you? When we moved to Georgia and we bought our home, I think our interest rate may have been three or four percent. Not a bad interest rate at all, but I believe that the Spirit of God moved upon my husband and he said, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go, we had all, almost, you know, really, done really well with our home. He said, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and refinance. I said, okay, baby, whatever you feel like, you know, God is calling you to do, I'm with you. You go ahead and do it. So when the lawyer came to the house to do the closing, she looked at the papers and she said, I have never in my life seen an interest rate like this before. And I said, what do you mean? She said, they're almost giving this house to you. Your interest rate is 1.2%. 
Who? She says, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've never seen an interest rate at 1.2%. God intends to bless you. Will you open your heart and your mind to receive it in any way he desires to bless you? My husband goes to buy me a car. He's like, honey, you need another car. I was fine with what I had. I'm like, I'm good. I'm not, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm good. I, if I got something to get around, I'm good. He's like, no, no, we're going we're gonna to get you a car. And so he takes me to get a car. Same thing in the, in the dealership. He does the, they do the paperwork, and he gets an interest rate for like 1.7%. Like, who, who hears of things like this before? It's God who's wanting to prosper you. It's God, who, and he has many methods and many ways to be able to get into your hands the things that he desires for you to have. Let's look at an example in the Bible. Let's take a look at Joseph. Genesis 39, verses 2 through 3. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now here we see the favor of God is a mechanism for prosperity. When people like you, they like you. And they do stuff for you without you even asking. And if they see the gifts and the callings and the anointings on their lives, they will move out of the way if they got good sense and allow God to use you because they know that if you're used by God, they're going to be blessed because you're blessed. They know that. So Potiphar recognizes that Joseph is blessed by God and everything that he sets his hands to do, it succeeds. Now, in this scripture, you would think, oh my God, Joseph is so prosperous. But when you look at the facts of his life, it's stunning. Joseph was a slave. He owned nothing. He was owned by someone else. And yet the Bible says he was prosperous. Come on, change the way you think about prosperity. You think you bound? Do you think for one moment that Joseph thought that he was bound because he was somebody's slave? He was working out that anointing in his life. And sometimes we are put in positions or jobs and we think, oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. We are kicking and screaming to and from. And the blessings of God is upon you, not for you, but it's upon you so that you can be a blessing to others. Well, you know the story. Potiphar's wife was liking on Joseph, but he wasn't having it because he was a man of integrity. People who are prosperous have integrity. They will not do things against God. They know and they fear God. And he said, oh, no, I'm not going to do this wicked thing. I won't do this. I won't sin against my God. So she framed him. And he went to jail for a crime that he did not commit. But even in jail, the Bible says that he prospered. Even in jail, Joseph don't have no house. Joseph don't have no chariot. Joseph don't have no servants. He is in jail. Yet God called him prosperous. He was prosperous. Why? Because the favor of God was upon his life. This is the ways and the means of God. Prosperity is favor. You have an empowerment. Woo, Jesus. There is an empowerment upon your life for prosperity. So the jailer is like, oh, this person is blessed. Let me turn all of the jailees over to him. And so he was in charge of the jailhouse prosperous. But Joseph had a longing to get out of there. He didn't understand the full plan of God yet. And so they found out that he could interpret dreams. And so he finally interprets the dream and he gets into the palace of the king. So now, long story short, Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh 
And because of that, he becomes the number two man in Egypt. He's the governor. He's the prime minister. He has control of all of the resources at that time in that region. There was a famine in the land. So everybody else was being wiped out by the famine. And Pharaoh was multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And who was in control of all these resources? Joseph. And so finally, God elevates him. And he now has a wife and children, servants, and a home. But the Bible doesn't talk about all of those things. You know he has them because his brothers comes to his home to visit him. The whole purpose of God sharing this story with you is to see the difference of the prosperity in people's lives. He was blessed to be a blessing and to save his nation from starvation so that the covenant that God had with Abraham, Isaac, and his father Jacob would be per per uh, perpetuated. That was what this was all about. His suffering, the things that he endured, it was for a greater cause. Your prosperity is for a greater cause. It's not just about you. It's not just about you getting to eat and you getting to wear and you getting to live and you getting to drive. I was sharing um, with Nikita on the way. I said, I am so over things. I don't know what in the world to do. Things have to be maintained. You have to pay for them. You have to take care of them. I'm over all of that. God, what do I need to do to be a blessing to somebody else? How can I help in the kingdom of God? What can I do, God? Show me. Give me a heart of compassion. Let that be my prosperity. One day I was driving home from the hospital, and I saw this homeless person. And I was so broken inside because she was mentally ill and she was sitting by the side of the road by exit and she had no clothes on. And she was talking to herself. And I say, God, what, what can I do? How can I help? Let me not walk past people who are hurting and people who, who need our help and pay them no attention. Will you be the good Samaritan that God desires you to be? Will you be that person who will respond to a need so that your blessings will be able to bless someone else? So again, we look at the facts of Joseph's life. He started out, he was a slave, he was in jail. He finally came into the, the uh, Pharaoh's graces and God used him to save his people. I was thinking of another testimony, and I have a hundred of them, but I was thinking of another testimony of how God's favor is prosperous to us. I was in graduate school, I think this is about eight or nine years ago, I was in graduate school, and I just needed one more class to graduate. I was tired, I was like, God, I'm so tired of school, I'm ready to be finished, I'm just done with this, I am just so done, you know, with this. I registered for the last class, and all of a sudden I was dropped from the class. And so I called the guidance counselor and I said, hey, what, what's happening? And she said, oh, we, we, we won't offer that class until next year. So, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, the devil is a lie. I'm not waiting till next year. I can't do this no more. And so she said, uh, oh, oh, no, Beverly, you, you don't understand. Um, the, te the professor who teaches this course, he's going on missions. And so he's going to be in Nicaragua or somewhere for a whole year. So he won't be back. And I said, and you don't have nobody else to do this class? No, I'm so sorry. We have no one else to do this class. You're going to have to wait. And I said, well, you know what, baby? I said, I'm going to be like Hezekiah, and I'm going to turn my face to the wall. And I'm going to talk to God. And I said, because for me, this is serious. This might not be serious to y'all, but for me, this is serious because I can't do this no more. I, I'm done, you know, and so, so I said, what can you do? And so she said, well, I go talk to the dean. So she goes and she talks to the dean and tells the dean the situation. And so I had taken classes from the dean, and the dean said, oh, yeah, Beverly, I know Beverly. Oh, she's an awesome student. Yeah, let's, let's make this happen for her. 
And so the, the counselor says, uh, sir, you really don't have the power to be able to make this happen for her. This has to go to the ch chancellor of the, of the university. Um, we don't have a teacher. Um, we don't have other students in the class. Like, she goes through the whole thing. And so at the time she was sharing this, another one of my professors was in the office. And so she says, oh, I know Beverly. She said, I'll tell you what. She said, I will teach the course for free just for her, just for her. What university in their right mind would do something like that? They don't. This is an accredited university, Regent University, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And they just like, oh, I'll do it for free. Don't worry about it. So the, the counselor says, uh, ma'am, you don't even have the power to make that decision. We still have to go to the chancellor. So they take it all the way to the chancellor. And the chancellor said, of course. I've, I've heard wonderful things about Beverly. Yes, we will do this for her. So I am the only student in the class, the last class that I need to graduate with my graduate degree. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. I'm telling you, we're looking for prosperity in different places, the wrong places. Sometimes it's not just about money. It's about God's favor on your life. It's about you walking out your life before people so that they know that God is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Go with me to 3 John, verse Chapter 1, verse 2, 3 John. Now, Pastor Cynthia began last Sunday with addressing how we think concerning prosperity. And she conveyed to us that we are not limited by how much money we have or do not have, but we're only limited by the way that we think. The Word of God declares in 3 John 1 and 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. God uses our soul as a way and a means to get prosperity and success to us. As a matter of fact, he says that our soul must prosper in order for us to walk in this manifestation of success. Now, within our soul lies our mind, our will, and our emotions, our thinker, our feeler, and our chooser. Now, if the thinker, feeler, and chooser is not on the right track, then we're not going to make correct decisions for our lives. And so God's soul prosperity is about you being a whole person. It's about your emotions being healthy. It's about your choices and the decisions that you make that they are healthy. It's about your will being in alignment with God's will. That's the wholeness that he's talking about, about being in health. The word prosper means a journey on a particular road. It properly means a prosperous journey. It means to be on the right path or a profitable path, leading to real success, good fortune, where someone is truly prosperous. The way you think will be profitable to you because you will do what is profitable when you think in a profitable way. You think first, then you act. So how you think is based on whether or not you're going to do something or not do something. It's about your choices. The way in which you choose and how you choose and what you choose keeps you on the right or profitable path that leads to real success and good fortune. You can discern whether or not God's timing is right for you to buy a home, to buy a car, to take a trip, to do whatever it is that you want to do. It's about discerning God's timing for you. Our soul needs to prosper. When our soul is prospering, our motives for prosperity is correct. We're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. We're not trying, we're, we, when I was a child growing up, we lived next to a neighbor, it's, she was hilarious. 
My father has passed on, God rest his soul, but the neighbor is still there. And no matter what my dad did to his house or the yard, she had to do the same thing. And we call that keeping up with the Joneses. We're not doing things to keep up with the Joneses. I'm not buying something because you bought it. I can celebrate with you because I know where my prosperity is. And I can celebrate your prosperity. I don't have to be envious or make rash or quick decisions. I can do the things that I need to do because my soul is prosperous. I'm not buying and purchasing things on a whim or doing something because of how I feel. We know that this walk is by faith and not by sight. But it's important that our emotions are healthy. It's important that God is able to speak to us through our spirit, and then it's our soul man that's the bridge between your spirit and your body. And so it's important that that is in alignment and your emotions are in alignment with what God has for you. Real success, not living from paycheck to paycheck. Real success means I go to bed at night and I sleep well. I'm rested. I'm not worried about where, how I'm going to pay the next bill or where the money is going to come from. I'm at rest. I'm at peace. That's soul prosperity. You know, before the GPS or the Google Maps, we had to actually take a real, y'all remember the, the road maps? I know some of y'all young, y'all might not remember, but the road maps, we were going on a road trip, right? And so sometimes you get on the road and you go on 30 minutes, 45 minutes before you realize you're on the wrong road. You stop at the gas station. Why we think the gas attendant is anointed for directions? We stop at the gas station and we ask the gas attendant or the worker, how do we get to so-and-so-and-so place? Come on, y'all. Like, really, right? And so what happens is they may put you on the wrong road again and you may go further or if you, you know, are fortunate and blessed, you get on the right road and you get to your destination. But what happens when you're not on this profitable path or this road to success or going to this destination? What happens is you lose time, you lose money, you lose resources, and you may have even missed an event. Maybe. So God is saying, I don't want you losing money. I don't want you losing resources. I don't want you to miss an event. That event is me. I don't want you to miss me going to where you need to go. God wants to put you on the right road, going in the right place, at the right time, seeing the right people. Amen. And so maybe, again, you're in a situation where maybe you didn't make the right decisions or the right choices. Let's go to Jeremiah 29. And you think, God, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to work my way out of this? God has a way of doing something phenomenal. I don't know about anybody else, but when I went to school, my older son went to school, we took out school loans. I used to look at that piece of paper every day. I said, this is of the devil, just the straight devil. You hear me? I would just be mad. Like, it was like almost $180,000 in school loans. That's half of a house. You know what I'm saying? I said, this is the devil. This is just the devil. I just, Jesus, you know, and I, sometimes I would rip it up. Don't mean that I didn't have to pay the bill, but I would just rip it up. Because I felt like, you know, it's predatory lending. They're taking advantage of people who are trying to be educated and do the things that they need to do. But nevertheless, I would pay the bill and I would pray. And I would speak over it, and I would call for a supernatural debt cancellation. I did not not pay my bills because I don't believe that's the right thing to do. I believe if we make a bill, you should pay the bill. Amen? That's integrity. And so I paid the bill every month, and I kept paying it. And then when the opportunity came to do the paperwork for the school loan forgiveness, I started speaking in tongues. I said, oh, this is mine right here, God. I know you about to bust a move on this right here. This is over. Like, all of this is over. I'm not doing this no more. And finally got a letter in the mail. It was last year. And it was canceled. $60,000 of school loan debt. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I know some of y'all out here have probably experienced the same thing too. God is good. 
And when I think back on it, I'm like, God, I don't even know if I asked your permission to take out a school loan. I just automatically did it because that was the thing, you know, that you did at the time. You're going to school, your kids going to school, you do a school loan. And so what I've learned now is to take serious thoughts and consideration and prayer and seeking God for every decision that is made, especially financial decisions. Because you know what? As you get older, you have less time to recover from the dumb mistakes that I make. You got less time. So if you're 60, it's not like you're 20 and you got all of these years to recover. No, no, as you get older, you got less time to recover. So you need to use the wisdom of God in order to do this. Can somebody say amen? amen? Jeremiah 29, this is what the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel says to all the exiles who were carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. He says to them, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat your produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. In other words, have grandchildren so that they too may have sons and daughters. Multiply there. He's talking to exiles, people who were disobedient, who were idolatrous. He sent them away to Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar. Yet he tells them in this exile state to multiply. He says, seek the prosperity of the city to which I have sent you as exiles. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for if it prospers, you too will prosper. God ain't mad at you because you made mistakes. God ain't mad at you because you messed up. This is why it's important to know his ways and his means, the character of God, that he's a forgiving God. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. He wants to see you prosper and to succeed. And then he says in verse 10, for this is what the Lord says, when Babylon's 70 years are complete, he says, I will attend to you and confirm my promise to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you reach for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore you from captivity and gather you from all the nations and places to which I have banished you, declares the Lord. I will restore you to that place from which I sent you into exile. God wants to restore you. God wants you to have everything that he desires for you to have. He's made a promise. He has a covenant with us. And the Bible says that all of his promises are yes and amen. Yes and amen to you. During Tuesday night, Elder Rick preached and he shared about the principles of sowing and reaping. And he gave powerful testament to the workings of God concerning sowing seeds through tithes and offering that caused his soul to prosper and got him out of debt. The principles of sowing and reaping is merely another way for God to show resources to you. You sow and then you reap. He gives seed to the sower. He provides bread to you. The very seed that you sow comes to God, comes from God. And as we grow in the Lord, we come to recognize that everything we own belongs to God. We don't own nothing. We're but stewards of what God has given us. And it is for his use in the kingdom of God. So principles, Elder Rick said, work every time you follow the principle. Every time you sow, you should reap a harvest. Now, of course, your harvest, the amount of harvest you get, will be determined by the amount of seed you plant. But it's a principle that works over and over and over again. Just another way and another means for God to get to you. Genesis 2, 19. And out of the ground, our Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called them, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Pastor Cynthia talked about this on Sunday, about being creative with God. We're co-creators with God. 
But I want to dig a little deeper in the, into this, and I want to connect the word prosperity with name. So a name is not a label. God brought the animals to Adam, and Adam named them. So the name is not a label. Adam named them, and the name is actually a designation of that thing. It's telling that thing what it is. So when God calls you blessed, he designates blessings to come to you, prosperity to come to you. He sets you up. So because of the time, I'm just going to go right through. So Isaac sold in a time of famine. And because God had called Isaac blessed, the blessings of God was upon him. So just imagine, if you will, there's a famine, the earth is dry, he put seed in the ground, dry ground. Now you know that in order for a seed or a plant to grow, it needs sunshine, it needs water, and nutrients need to be in the soil. None of that existed. And yet the Bible says Isaac prospered, and he brought forth a hundredfold harvest that same year. Now I don't know how God did this, Maybe there was a water reservoir underneath the area where he planted the seeds. God has a way of getting prosperity to you even in the times when there is famine. Nobody else is prospering, but Isaac is prospering. He becomes wealthy. The Bible says he gets rich. Why? Because he has been designated blessed. You have been designated blessed. Blessings will run you down and will take you over. Things will come to you because you are blessed. God has called you blessed. Come on, say, I'm blessed. I'm empowered to prosper. You are blessed, beloved. You're not cursed. You are blessed. Everything that your hand touches, it prospers because you're blessed. That anointing that's on your life, you're blessed. You go into work and stuff is just happening. It's all in disarray and the Holy Spirit drops an idea down on the inside of you and you share it and all of a sudden there's calmness all over the office. You shifted that atmosphere because the blessings followed you to where you were. That name is a designation. It is a place. It is not just a name. It is a place called blessings. You are a place called blessings. Your mind is blessed. Your body is blessed. The words you speak is blessed. It's blessed. Your household is blessed. Your children are blessed. Your bank accounts, they're blessed. You got money, it's blessed. You are designated blessings, baby, blessed. Everything, you drive a blessing, you live in a blessing. You are blessed. Your neighborhood is blessed because you're in it. Blessed. Ain't nobody stealing, ain't nobody breaking in. Why? Because you're there. You're blessed. You're blessed. Blessing is a place. It's a designation. It's on you. It's on you. The presence of God is on you to bless you and to prosper you and to cause you to be the man and woman of God that he's called you to be. Every area of your life is blessed. Your body is blessed. Yeah, I know it hurts. Yeah, I know you feel pain, but you're blessed. You are healed because you're blessed. He lives in you. Blessings. Coming and going. Blessings. In the city, in the field. Blessings. Your cupboards are blessed. Your food is blessed. I don't care what they putting in it, but when you bless that food, it's blessed. 
is blessed. You are blessed and you must see yourself as blessed. I don't care what your credit report looks like. It don't matter. It could be shot, but you are blessed. You ain't got to have no money. No, you are blessed. You're blessed. God has set this thing up, and he has made you a designated place of blessing so that everything in the universe, you need verse, one verse, one, moves towards you because you're blessed. Everything. You go shopping. You don't pay no attention to the tag, but you get to the register and they say, oh, this is on sale. Praise God. Why? Because you're blessed. You are blessed. You are a money multiplier. Blessed. God, breathe on this. I'm telling you, when your heart is right and your mind is right before God, you can ask God to breathe on that money, multiply that money so you can do good. You're blessed. You're blessed. I want to leave a legacy for my children. You're blessed that your children's children will have what they need. You're blessed. So the blessings of God is a designation. It is a place. Just like Adam named all of those animals, whatever he called them, that's what they were. Whatever God calls you, that's what you are. Whatever he calls you. So you are that place of blessings. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet.